So in this problem, we have an unknown compound and we have the formula for the unknown. Um, and let's write it a little bit bigger because that's kind of small. So we see that it is C10H12O2. And then all of these spectra, we have a mass spectrum, a proton, NMR, an IR spectrum, and a carbon-13. So it's important to remember that all of these spectra correspond to the same molecule. Um, so wherever you feel comfortable starting with information, I would start there. But in the end, you want to make sure that everything is consistent to the same molecule that matches this molecular formula. So oftentimes, um, infrared spectroscopy is a nice place to start. And I like to start there to get an idea of the functional groups. So I can see we've got this set of peaks here. And that's a little bit small to read. So this is at... 3092 to around 3036. So that's pretty indicative. That's in the range of um, sp2 hybridized carbons. So this, and specifically it's the carbon hydrogen bond, I should say that. So this tells you that you've got like an alkene or maybe even a benzene ring in the molecule. And I will say that with a molecular formula with 10 carbon atoms, I am personally hoping for a benzene ring because that would locate in one swoop six of those 10 carbon atoms. So I might look to see if this is paired with a peak like this one here at 1603 that is consistent with a benzene ring. And so we do see that. Right. And by that same token, we should also see signs of that benzene ring in the proton LMR and the carbon. So if I was suspecting that, I might just briefly step away from my infrared spectrum and look for peaks in the aromatic region of the proton NMR and the aromatic region of the carbon. And these are the ones that I'm circling. So just with a quick glance over to these other types of spectra, it definitely looks like we have a benzene ring. So I will go ahead and draw a benzene ring. So it's quite helpful to start drawing these pieces of your molecule and then see how you can kind of assemble them together. And so other information we can get from the infrared spectrum. We've also got some other CH stretches. So these ones are at 2971 to 2881. So that looks like some alkanes, some sp3 carbon hydrogens. And then we also see that we have at 1721. So that's a carbonyl. And so this 1721 value, unfortunately, is kind of an ambiguous carbonyl because it's kind of in the range where we might see an aldehyde, we might see an ester, we might see um, a ketone. So it'd be a good idea to get some other information. We can, it could be a carboxylic acid just from that number alone, granted, right? So then we want to look at the other information. We don't have an OH. So it's not a carboxylic acid. We don't have aldehyde CHs. So it's not an aldehyde. So that leads you with the idea that this might be either a ketone or an ester. And so a fast way to figure that out if you have a carbon 13 is to find that carbon yield peak in the carbon 13 and it's at 167 and see if that's consistent with a ketone or an ester. And this is consistent with an ester. So those typically show up at approximately 165 to 175 ppm versus for a ketone it would be down here. So we've got a pretty good idea that we have an ester. So let's just kind of draw that framework for an ester. So you've got bonds to different carbon groups on either side of that ester. Okay, um, and that's really all the information we can get from the IR, but that's, that's actually quite a bit of information. We, we know a lot about this molecule already, especially for something with only 10 carbon atoms. We've got a pretty good idea of where at least, you know, some of them fit together. So let's look at this proton NMR. And so one of the first things I would want to know is about what kind of benzene ring we have. So I would want to look in this aromatic region. So here's our aromatic region. And I would notice that I have a two hydrogen signal and I have a three hydrogen signal. And they both say multiplet. So that just means that they see hydrogens nearby, but there's not a really well-defined splitting pattern. Uh, but that's okay. It at least tells us that they have neighbors. So our structure, they sh should have some neighbors. Um, so what I would do here is I'd use this information to say, okay, well, I have a total of five aromatic hydrogens. 
So a total of five aromatic hydrogens. This tells me that I have a mono-substituted benzene ring. Okay, so how does it tell me that? Well, if it was an unsubstituted benzene, it would have six hydrogens. And just a little bit of quick math here, six minus five means that I have replaced one of them. And that's why I'm saying it's a mono-substituted benzene ring. Okay, um, so maybe one of these two carbon atoms is a carbon of the benzene ring. So let's take a look at everything else in the proton NMR spectrum. So we have a two hydrogen triplet. Okay, and if we look at that chemical shift value, it looks like it's at about 4.2 ppm. So this looks like a signal for an alkane that's next door to an oxygen. So this two hydrogen triplet sure looks a lot to me like it'd be something like this fragment. So two hydrogens because there's two hydrogens. I'm attaching it to the oxygen because with a chemical shift of 4.2, I know it's attached to something electronegative. And with the idea of this framework here, I know I need to have some hydrogens. This is that ester that we had said we had. So I know that I need to have some hydrogens potentially on this carbon that's attached to the oxygen, unless of course that was the benzene ring, but that doesn't appear to be the case. And if we follow our splitting pattern, we should be able to, because all of these are split, we should be able to build this chain. So a triplet means that there it sees two hydrogens. So most likely, let's just start numbering this chain. So let's call this A. So we'll call these signal A. Most likely, what's next door to this is another CH2. Um, because that would give us n equals 2 for two neighbors. And we do indeed have a peak that is another CH2. It's two hydrogens. So it really seems like we're just building a chain moving away from that oxygen. So let's look at the information. So this says it is a two hydrogen sextet. So this sure fits. So we have a CH2. Right, so a sextet means it's split into six, so it has five neighbors. So if we see two neighbors next door, and let me go ahead and label this as B, so we're being nice and clear. If we see two neighbors on one side, that means we need to have three neighbors on the other side. And we still have a signal that looks like a CH3 because it says three hydrogens. So let's go ahead and build that chain and then look at this final signal, which I'm going to call C. So this final signal, it tells us that this is a three hydrogen triplet, right? So we are going to label this as C. And so that three hydrogen triplet then makes sense. It's three hydrogens because it's a CH3, a triplet because it's next door to the two. And so now we can really explain why this signal for B is split into six because it has a total of two and three. So five neighbors, five plus one is six. So we have, actually found everything in this molecule. So we know that we have a mono-substituted benzene ring. We know that we have an ester. And now we know that on the oxygen side of the ester is this chain, which means that on the other side of the ester, it's got to be this benzene ring because that would account for all 10 of our carbon atoms. We have three here, one for the carbonyl, so that's four, and then six from the benzene ring. So that means that we have attached the benzene ring, this oxygen, or sorry, the carbonyl, and then the oxygen, and then CH2, CH2, CH3. So that is our molecule. So it looks like we have propyl benzoate as our unknown. So propyl benzoate. Okay, and then we always want to make sure that all of the information makes sense. So if we look down to the carbon 13, we see four aromatic carbons. And so if we look at the symmetry in this ring, um, we've definitely got the one unique signal here. These two should be the same as each other. 
these two, and finally this one. So four aromatic carbons make sense. And then this alkane chain should be here. This is that sp3 carbon atom range. And we definitely see the signal at 67 that's consistent with a carbon attached to oxygen. And then the other two carbons just moving down the chain. So that makes sense as well. And then we should finally, I mean, we've completely neglected the mass spectrum until this point. So we should at least make sure we can account for the base peak. So here is our base peak. So that's the peak at 100% abundance. And we can see that this is at an M over Z value of 105. And so that sure looks like you're losing this entire propoxy group. So what this is, and we've seen this a couple times, is this resonance stabilized acyllinium ion. And so this corresponds to the base peak. And if you were to add up the weight of the carbon and the hydrogens and the oxygen in this molecule, you'd find out that it weighs 105. Um, so now we've verified that everything matches, right? We've got an ester that's got a benzene ring. It's got an alkane portion. Um, we can explain the proton, the signals match for the carbon, and we can even explain that base peak. So we can be pretty confident in identifying our unknown.